I'll take the clicker. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much. They are really beautifully bright. What an incredible stage. Um, so I have three core beliefs. And the first is that if you want to see the future, you need to pay attention to the edges of whatever field or network that you're in. And that means following the artists and the hackers and the makers. And in healthcare, that means following people who are living with rare disease or life-changing diagnoses. The second of my core beliefs is that if you are brave enough to share your problem, especially if you've cultivated a community where you can safely share your problem, help will emerge. And my third core belief is that the internet gives us access not only to information, but also to each other. And it's that wisdom of the crowds that's really going to save us, especially in healthcare, but I think in many fields. And it's especially if we can get access to a diverse crowd. Um, once we tap into the knowledge, that latent knowledge that all of us maybe don't share yet, but we really should, that's when we're really going to unlock the potential for change. So I came by these core beliefs after doing about 15 years of field work. Um, in patients, uh, communities of patients living with rare and life-changing diagnoses. What I saw is that they're willing to use any tool available to them to try and network their way to the right clinical trial or pain relief any way they can to improve their lives or it's often a child's life. And uh, what I saw is that they are the true entrepreneurs of healthcare. And, um, <laughs> And what is, what's amazing to see is, is that I was able to bring that spirit, that spirit of the e-patient movement into my job as the chief technology officer. What I saw in my field work, for example, in a community of people living with um, a very rare condition called Mobius syndrome, it presents as full facial paralysis. It's about one in a million births. And immediately you have a problem. You have an infant who can't get milk, that they can't suck on a nipple. And so you immediately need to figure out how to feed a baby. Um, and so they, what they do is they, they hack a, a nipple so that, um, on a bottle so that they're able to open up and the child is able to drink milk. These communities are not only sharing information and data, they're sharing modifications and new designs for assistive technology for themselves and for their children and sharing those designs online. So when I became the chief technology officer at the US Department of Health and Human Services, I decided to expand the definition of technology beyond what people think of in terms of health and technology, beyond health IT, um, to include medical and assistive technology. Um, I'm really fascinated with the maker movement. And so I want to pause for a second and talk about um, who makers are in our culture. Makers modify and improve the world around them. They look at a problem and not only say, I'm going to solve that. They say, my community is going to solve that. They, um, they're all about a return to craft and making things with their hands, but upgraded thanks to new capabilities like 3D printers. Um, and so what I'm seeing in the landscape is the possibility that healthcare is going to fundamentally change once again thanks to this new movement. And I see a parallel between the empowered patient movement and the maker movement. I really believe that the democratization of information and data that we saw over the last 15 years is going to be mirrored in the democratization of access to tools um, and manufacturing. So when I started walking this idea around HHS and around the federal government, I met with some resistance. Um, I'm used to that. I'm used to now, after leading innovation teams in various industries over the last 20 years, I'm used to people not believing me when I say that the industry that they're in is about to change because of technology. <laughs> um, that's OK. I'm, I'm very comfortable being called weird and being called different, um, because on my home planet, I'm normal. I know that this is actually what's going to happen. I'm just an ambassador from the future here to tell you what's, what's going to happen. You can believe me or not. Um, what I do is look for people who share my core beliefs, people who lean into the curves and say, let's go faster. And it turns out in the federal government, those people work at NASA. 
Um, so what I found is that when I started talking to people at NASA, we realized that we had a shared mission. Both HHS and NASA have a mission for sustaining human life in extreme environments. So the same skills that you need in setting up a clinic um, in a crisis like Ebola, those are the same skills that you need uh, when trying to figure out how to fix something on the International Space Station. Um, and there's a parallel between the skills that NASA is trying to build in its astronauts in terms of problem solving and collaboration, making things with their hands if they have to. There's a parallel between the skills that an astronaut needs in a mission to Mars and how a caregiver feels when something happens in the middle of the night. Nobody's coming. It's just you and the people that you're with, and you need to solve that problem. And so we decided to hold a two-day symposium um, down in Texas, uh, one day at the Johnson Space Center, and um, these are some pictures from JSC in Houston. Um, and then the second day was at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Um, we put together an incredible group of people. We had uh, NASA flight surgeons and engineers. I invited um, some of my sort of lean into the curve colleagues from the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health. We invited two people who had wintered over in Antarctica. Um, we had people who were experts in um, disability and assistive technology. We had someone who was an expert in what it's like for an older adult who's living alone, because that's very much like how it's going to be in the mission to Mars. We had someone who helped to design the first zero gravity 3D printer and who is an expert maker and is a first responder after, let's say, an earthquake in Haiti or Nepal. She lands on the ground and helps people um, local create fresh water supply. By the way, that's the same person who worked on the zero gravity 3D printer and who's a first responder, Dara Dots, she's amazing. Um, it was very uncomfortable at first. The first hour of our symposium was spent trying to translate the acronyms that we each were using and translate the language. But what emerged was the possibility of connections between all of our fields that none of us had foreseen before we all came together for that symposium. And um, what I'm happy to say is that I'll leave political office on or before January 20th, um, and these connections and relationships will sustain. What I saw when I was visiting was um, the spirit of the maker movement at both locations. Um, this first slide um, you'll see is um, this is in the robot and rover workshop at the Johnson Space Center. And it's about the size of an airplane hangar. And they're actually designing the robots and rovers that are going to go up on the International Space Station or the mission to Mars. Um, these are the bins that we saw the next day in the first makerspace in a hospital. This is where nurses are being given access to the technology and tools and know-how to prototype and test solutions to clinical challenges that they see. There's an engineer that sits in the makerspace at UTMB to help the nurses with their ideas. One example is Jason Schaefer. He is a burn unit nurse at UTMB who is inspired by the experience of caring for someone with a chemical burn. What he um, and his fellow nurses have to do is irrigate the skin for six hours, and all they had was, was single no, uh, nozzles of water. It was inefficient and it was exhausting. So he designed a portable shower unit um, that has three heads that are completely adjustable. And uh, it's now actually being used uh, at UTMB. And what it does is it allows the nurses to care for the patient in other ways, even as they irrigate the skin. And it's an example of collaboration between a nurse and an engineer in the same way that we saw the way um, flight surgeons learning from first responders. Um, and that's really the connection that I want to see in the broader population. I want to see more of this idea of invention doesn't happen in a alone in a lab in, in almost a priestly capacity. It happens in the community. And uh, what we've been waiting for is this new possibility 
of um, a platform for collaboration and innovation that really the internet has brought to us and the maker movement is bringing to us. The possibility that problem solvers can connect with need knowers, that nurses can work with engineers, that there is this possibility that as we return to the idea of craft, the idea of MacGyver patients, we can upgrade their skills with all of these low cost manufacturing tools that are becoming more available to us. We need to push open design principles out to the edges of the network where humanity lives. We need to make sure that everyone who has a problem finds a way to share it and to connect with people who might be able to solve that problem. And although there may be doubters, although there may be people who don't yet believe us, I have to say I know that this is the way that things are going. Because what did people think would happen when we connected a worldwide community of patients, caregivers, clinicians, scientists, engineers, artists, hackers, makers? We are going to solve these problems together. And it's just a question of how fast will it happen. I believe in the can-do spirit. I believe in people's creativity. I believe that if we give people the tools to solve problems, they will. Thank you. <laughs>